So the big question is this, how do small businesses like yours, who feel like you're doing all the right things and going to all the right events, reach the federal buyer in a way that helps you win more contracts? That is the question, and this is the place to get your answers. My name is Neil McDonald. Welcome to the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. Okay, let's get started. In this series, I'm sharing the top 10 steps every small business government contractor should take if you wanna be successful in the federal market. I included two bonus steps at the end of the series just to round it up to an even dozen. In a minute, I'll walk you through step five and why I think it's so important for you to choose a primary agency in business development. First though, this content is brought to you by the GovCon Chamber of Commerce, the only organization dedicated to the success of all small businesses in the federal space with members from Guam to the U.S. Virgin Islands and every single state in between. Each year, roughly $125 billion is awarded to small businesses as prime contractors. Our vision is to double that number by helping small businesses truly understand the process for success. Small businesses are the backbone of America. By helping you succeed further in government contracting, we'll be strengthening American communities together. My name is Neil McDonald, and I've been where you are now. I've been a small business owner for 20 years, building two successful firms selling to the federal government. I've won subcontracts with small and large prime contractors. I've won prime contracts with defense and civilian agencies. I've done things right and I've gotten things wrong. The one thing missing though for me then and you now is an easy to follow process that'll lead to predictable success. That's my commitment to you. I'll provide the process. If you accept responsibility and don't blame others, you'll find you have the control to shape your future. I put together this roadmap to help you understand the top 10 steps every small business must take as they travel down the road to success in federal government contracting. You can watch a previous video where I briefly introduce each of these steps. In this video, we'll be talking about choosing a primary agency to increase the likelihood of your success selling to the federal government. In step five, I'll talk with you about choosing a primary agency. First, I'll tell you what I mean by primary agency, then provide guidance on how to choose that primary agency. Once you have a primary agency defined, you'll wanna get started with business development activities, so I'll share some initial steps. Finally, I'll wrap up by giving you my two cents about primary agencies. First thing I wanna talk about is um, don't chase two rabbits here. And what that means, there's a great line that says, if you chase two rabbits, you're not gonna to eat tonight. And the whole point is you've got to focus on one rabbit, right? Otherwise, the two of, two of them will drive you nuts. And it's the same thing in sales. You need to focus on one customer. Otherwise, you won't be building a relationship solidly with them. And, and that's why I'm telling you to focus on just one agency, a primary agency. As you get larger, and when I say larger, I mean past $10 million, right? If you're below $10 million, um, you can chase one rabbit one primary agency and you'll be totally fine. Now, when you're thinking about the agencies out there, there's 24 CFO agencies, these large agencies that fall under um, a certain level of, of um, criteria or uh, regulations from the government. But there's actually hundreds of agencies out there. And as you're digging around, you need to find the one that fits with you. Um, you need to whittle this down. And if you don't, you can imagine how easy it is to get lost and distracted by going from one agency to the other and never really knowing an agency. I wanna share with you the difference in my mind between a primary agency approach where you focus on developing um, the primary agency, identifying opportunities, and then turning those into wins for you, comparing that against an RFP approach. So imagine if you did cloud technology. If you did a primary agency approach, you would find an agency like, let's say, um, Nav War out of the Navy. And you would dig in there, learn everything about um, uh, their cloud platform, what they have, uh, what stuff is still in legacy that needs to come over to the cloud, who are all the people running it, what are they talking about, what are some of the biggest challenges. Um, and all of this would be developed over months and months and even years as you continue to stay in there and get to know them better. There's a reason incumbents do better 
writing a response to a proposal or to an RFP than somebody who's new to an agency. It's because they're in there. They know the challenges. They talk with John or Jane, who's the director of IT, let's say, or director of cloud technology at NavWar. And so they understand this stuff. They have coffee with them. And if you don't um, have that same level of understanding, then you'll not be able to write as good proposals. But if you have a primary agency approach, you will be able to start developing that same relationship. Compare that now to an RFP approach where every time I see something that comes up for cloud or janitorial services or whatever, I'm bouncing around. I'm like, oh, let me go write a response there. Oh, let me go write a response there. Well, my responses to an RFP will all be the exact same because I never had time to develop knowledge about an agency. I didn't learn about their challenges. I didn't learn how they speak, right? How they say things in the military is different than how they say things in the Department of Education. And you want to speak the language of the people who are going to review your proposal. And so when you do this RFP approach, you're just really firing everywhere. And it needs to be a much more focused approach. And that's why I'm recommending the primary agency. So let's talk about how to choose your primary agency. There's four ways I'm going to recommend. Um, these are just starter ways, but one way is your core competency, right? They, they talk about looking in the federal government and find who's biased what you, what you sell. But if your core competency is something a little more unique than janitorial services, and the reason I say that is every single agency needs janitorial services, but maybe some agencies do cloud technology a lot more focused um, or they spend a lot more on it. Actually, even janitorial services. Now that I think about it, you could go into organizations, let's say the VA, where they have 150 hospitals, they have uh, 800 plus um, veteran business, or not veteran business, but um, community-based outreach centers, these hospitals that are in the rural centers. So you're talking about a thousand potential buildings, all of them needing janitorial services. Well, that's a good match. So you can try to choose your agency based on who might need the most of what you offer. Another way to do it is based on your location. Um, if you're in uh, Washington, DC, this might be harder because there's just every agency. But let's say you're in Colorado. In Colorado, there's just a few agencies out there. And USDA is an example. They're out there. You might decide, you know what? I'm just going to make USDA my primary agency because it's right here. I feel like I can get in. Um, you know, So base it on your location. The next one is your background. So I used to say this line about the, um, the Coast Guard. If you're a Coastie, they want to work with you first. Of course, they'll work with everybody, but you know they like Coast Guard uh, veterans. And same thing, if you're a vet uh, of the Army, then knocking on the Army's door before you knock on the Navy's door kind of makes sense. Just if you have some sort of connection to the agency, that also might be a way to help you choose your um, primary agency. It's a good natural fit. If you were in the army, like I was, then you can speak their language. It, all of it comes normal. So you don't have to ramp up on the jargon and language used in the army. You just have to sit there and get in and begin to talk business development. Okay, and the last suggestion I have for how to choose your primary agency is uh, around current relationships. And this is just, if you happen to know people in an agency and you can get, um, access to that agency. If you've watched other videos I've done on sales, I call these people focuses of receptivity. It means they're receptive to what you're asking for. They can't help you. They're, uh, they can't buy what you're selling because that's not their role in an agency, but they're willing to help you navigate their agency. So I might have a friend from church, John or Jane, who works at uh, Department of, um, works at HUD, let's say, and they can sit there and answer my questions. Hey, what's the uh, what's, how's HUD organized? You know, uh, do they have a contracting shop? You know, they're small business. Of course, a lot of the stuff you can get on the internet, but the point is you can kind of keep coming back to these people and they'll help you navigate the agency. They're not going to do anything unethical, but sharing with you basic information. Um, oh yeah, I'll make an introduction to the director of IT. I was just talking with him to get my computers fixed. Maybe he'll take a meeting or something. If you've got current relationships in an agency, you definitely want to um, explore that. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about how do you start performing business development in your primary agency once you've determined it. So let's say, for example, you chose um, the Navy, right? That's, that's one department out of many um, major commands or components of the Department of Defense, right? You have the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, Marines, but then inside of there, you've got all these major commands that are all 
equal to the size of let's say USDA or Department of Education. So anyways, let's you choose the Navy. The first thing you wanna do is identify the small business professional, schedule a meeting, um, reach out to them and, and let them know you're coming in uh, to their agency and you wanna do their homework, but you start by identifying who they are. Now, I chose the Navy because it's one of my favorite examples as it relates to small business professionals. They have like 150 small business professionals. The Navy does a great job engaging industry with the Navy needs um, around small businesses. And so these small business professionals um, are in there, a lot of them, but you want to choose the ones that fit into what you sell. And you'll notice as you go in to uh, begin to identify the small business professional that's right for you, that maybe 20, 30% of the 150 fit with what you sell and others are focused on welding and others are focused on buildings or something. If, if you're um, in the cloud, like I'm using for today's example. And by the way, let me pause for one second as I'm pulling this up. It's really important for everybody to remember business development is about getting into, into an agency and understanding everything about that agency. Um, and then when you move over to capture, that's about one single opportunity. Business development is trying to identify opportunities out of many opportunities you might find on forecast, as well as many opportunities you might develop yourself. And then capture is about just chasing that one opportunity to a proposal. So in here, I'm talking about um, performing business development, which is learning everything about the agency. So you want to identify agency context. Obviously, I talk about small business professional. You can think about contracting officers. But the, the ones that really matter, and again, I go back to cloud technology, are um, you know people who are in charge of the IT for, for the Navy, right? Who's, who are these leaders out there? And these, and more importantly to me, who are the people communicating to the public about it? Somebody who might've given a, a briefing at industry day, and you can see that they're the executive director of something uh, related. These are the type of contacts you wanna begin to find. They're, they're called program office contacts, right? Or program office representatives. These are people who are actually doing the work that you need. Um, so you wanna identify those people and it's not hard, right? Um, some, some uh, times it takes a little extra work, but it's not hard if you're doing good research on the internet or if you're engaging your small business professional, they'll help you begin to find the right people and learn more about that primary agency. And because you chose a single agency, most of your time is gonna be spent right here with this, um, uh, these kind of activities under performing BD out there. Okay, so once you identify these contacts, there, you, you wanna get on LinkedIn, by the way, stay off Twitter, stay off Facebook. Those are just not for business development and they're not for government contracting. Um, you know, and just to make sure it's clear why, uh, Facebook is for cats and my kids and I share my pictures of my kids with my mom or whoever, right? That's what Facebook is for. It's completely personal. And it's really important to remember that in an environment like the government, especially DOD or the intelligence side where everybody is very cautious about their profile, and um, being too visible, there's no reason any program office person would ever want you on their um, Facebook page, but they are on LinkedIn, um, you know, so you want to get out there. And then Twitter is just a, a chatter box, right? It's just Twitter is designed for you to see something every single second. And but LinkedIn is the everybody's professional resume, basically, is what they call it, right? So you want to find context on there because um, not to go too far into LinkedIn, but when you get in there, you can learn about them. Um, learn about what they're liking and posting and almost every single thing they do on there is professionally related, obviously compared to Facebook, which almost everything is personally related. So when you get in there, you can begin to see it, but you can also then look at who's connected to that person and find more contacts in that, in your agency that you might not have known about and say, Oh, great. I, I connected with Jane, but she knows John and, and John's title is program manager of the exact thing I want to research kind of thing, right? So follow these people on uh, LinkedIn. One last thing I'll talk to you about LinkedIn here is there's a difference between connecting and following. Connecting, um, connecting out there is, is a commitment, right? We're, we're saying, um, I'm going to connect to you and you're going to connect to me and I have to look at your feed, all this kind of stuff. But LinkedIn gives you this option to just follow somebody and by following them, anytime they post anything out there, you'll be you could be notified on it in your LinkedIn feed. It's a great way to just stay informed about what's going on. They don't necessarily need to follow you. They can decide later for themselves. But right now, if you follow them, you'll be able to stay informed of what they're doing. The other cool thing about following, and this is a 
Um, so government contracting is not a secret, but LinkedIn's a secret, right? So let me tell you a quick secret. When you follow somebody on LinkedIn, they will know it. It'll come up and say, hey, Jane, Neil McDonald has followed you. And many of the people you follow will take the time to come back to your LinkedIn profile and go, who is this Neil guy? And when they see it, they go, oh, he's with the GovCon chamber. Okay, I see what he's doing. And maybe they get pulled into my thing, but they see it. And, and now they've got visibility. This is helpful because later on in, uh, you know, let's say a month or two or three after I've been following him and maybe figuring out ways of how I might engage their content and engage them at some point, they'll remember. They'll say, oh, yeah, 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 we're connected on LinkedIn. Well, we're not connected. We're following. But it's that same thing. So you want to use LinkedIn's passive way of letting somebody know, hey, I'm just here. I'm interested in talking at some point, but I don't need a connection. I'm just following. Okay. Last thing on how to perform business development in your primary agency is to now that you have all these contacts you've, you've um, identified is to begin to outreach to them. Uh, you want to call them. Uh, I've got a whole set of video training inside the GovCon Chamber environment that you can find on www.govconchamber.com. And in there, it's a free training that talks about sales. And in particular, how do I do a cold call? How do I reach out to these people if I've never done it? And I'll give you a quick little um, uh, hint about what's in there, right? The, the course is long, but the, the basics of it is you want to call and leave a, uh, a message. If you don't reach them, you want to leave a voicemail and say, hey, I'm calling to introduce myself. Um, if you get them, what I always say, and again, this is one of Neil's uh, tips out there that is just a proven sales tip, is you don't want to have a meeting right when you reach them. So if I call somebody and I say, hey, um, I'm, this is Neil McDonald with GovCon Chamber. Uh, John, I'm just calling to see if I can schedule a time to have an introduction call. Um, when you do this, it allows that other person to know that they can hang up pretty fast with you, but it also allows you both to prepare. So you can schedule a call a week or two out, and now you take your time to reset, research that person. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they have a list of 10 people they're going to call, and so they do all this homework and research on them. It's like, no, no, no. Do some basic research then schedule a meeting, then do in-depth research and um, create a call plan sheet that you can use when you're calling that person. So anyways, when you identify your primary agency, these are some good tips right here in the bottom right about how to perform business development. Identify the small business pro because they're going to be your biggest advocate. Identify agency contacts, and I recommend about 25 of them in the program office arena. And then follow those contacts on LinkedIn if you can, so you can be aware of what they're posting out there related to what you sell. And then the final thing is just begin knocking on doors and perform that initial outreach to the agency uh, points of contact. Let me give you some last minute thoughts with Neil's two cents here. Um, the first one is the value of a primary agency. And this is why it's so important to me is I always tell people, if you're in federal government, don't be in commercial. I am not one of those people who would recommend that you should be doing commercial, state, and local, and federal. How could you possibly do that with the limited resources you have? But if you go tight into the federal, you know that there's a big amount of money, uh, you know, 100 billion plus for smalls. And um, they all use the same tools. An example is your CPARs. If you do good work for an agency, then other agencies will be able to reference that, um, that rating in CPARs. But if you do good work in the Navy, Navy people value the Navy's uh, past performances more than they would value the Department of Education. Not to beat up on the Department of Education, but Department of Education would probably value your past performance in their agency before the Navy. Um, and, and so that's why you wanna focus on a primary agency because once you're in, and it is a lot of work initially, but when you start going forward and you have contract after contract, they might be $25,000 contracts, then a hundred, then a couple hundred thousand, then a million, then 5 million, right? You're not getting a big contract out of the gate. But if you start getting these contracts, you'll be able to build on past performance after past performance um, directly related to the customer you're trying to sell to, the Navy, let's say, as an example here. Okay, the next thing I, I really want you to... Um, Keep in mind is when I say a primary agency, I don't mean a part-time gig at this or a part-time job. You want to become such a subject matter expert or SME on your primary agency that you know more about the Navy, let's say, than almost anybody. Um, I, I have a nephew who's uh, in the Navy and he's an officer on, um, let's say, submarines. How much does he really understand 
about the program executive offices that are in NAVWAR supporting IT? Or how much does he really know about um, uh, battleships or whatever, right? And I'm not trying to pick on my nephew, but the point is people in the Navy are busy doing their job. And, and they're not trying to become an expert at the Navy, they're trying to become an expert at, let's say, submarines. But if you go in there and you say to yourself, I want to become an expert, a subject matter expert on the Navy. Anybody ask me about the Navy, I'm going to know. I'm going to know their top contract vehicles. I'm going to know where their top 10 uh, NAICS codes are that are being spent. I'm going to know the top 10 primes that are in there. I'm going to know the top 10 successful hub zones, the top 10 successful women-owned firms. I'm going to know their strategic documents or the strategic goals, or the challenges. I'm going to know everything about the, the Navy as an example for a primary agency. You won't do that in a day, but I'm telling you right now, if you choose a primary agency and you go after it in a year, two years, you will be that expert. And you'll see in a minute why that is so important. So here I, I've been referencing the Navy and I wanna drive uh, one other tip in there. The Navy is too high for most small businesses. Um, you wanna go in and pick a single major buying command within the Navy. Navy has 10 uh, buying commands, has a whole, whole bunch of other commands, but you know, 10 major buying commands, for example, um, NAV SUP on the supply side, NAV FAC, which is facilities, um, uh, NAV WAR, which is naval information. So IT work, basically, IT, everybody does IT, but they're the leads on it. Um, NAV C, which is focusing on the submarines and the, um, the ships, surface ships, et cetera. So each of them have their focus. You want to choose one of them before you get, as you get started, right? If you're a small business, say, you know what, we're going to become an expert at Nav C with the goal of then graduating to be an expert of the Navy. Um, you, it's hard to go in there at, at the beginning and say, I'm going to become an expert at the Navy because the Navy is so big. Um, and so anyways, go deep when you go in there. Some other agencies, like if you went into USDA, they're not that big. Um, so you can, you can get to know them holistically. If you went into HHS, they've got CDC and NIH. NIH is like the Navy, right? It's so big. It's got so many parts to it. So you would want to become an expert at NIH, which is a subordinate agency of health and human services. And then you get um, further engaged with HHS. It's just my recommendation on go deep to find that primary agency. And the last um, tip in my two cents that I want to give you is something I was referring to on the become a SME on your primary agency is you want to choose a primary agency that has the ability to give you $50 million a year, right? And, and what I'm talking about is you should expect the agency to be so big that once you do this work and once you become a subject matter expert in there, that you know that you'll be able to move from winning $100,000 contracts to $1 million contracts to $10 million contracts to $100 million contracts. And you know, as you grow and your company matures and you get more successful, you should be able to expect that. I absolutely am not saying, um, you know, if you've got no money or you're a million dollar firm, you're going to be a $50 million firm next year. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you want to look at an agency and say, if I'm going to invest the time, I want the return to be big. And so if, if you went with, um, uh, well, let's say the White House, right? The White House has an kind of like an agency where it's called the executive office of the president. Sounds cool. You get a contract, you get to go down and work in the, um, the old executive building or the, or the West Wing or whatever. But it actually is a, it's a horrible gig from my perspective because um, it's too small. Their budget is tiny. Like let's say a $10 million total budget for IT or something. And um, that's not good for you. But if you go into the Navy, and the Navy spending $10 billion a year on IT, well, now you know that the, the chances of you growing to a $50 million revenue um, stake in there is good if you do your work, if you follow the process, um, if you perform excellently and have great CPARs, then um, you'll be able to see it. So choose an agency that's gonna be able to give you that growth and reward your efforts to become a subject matter expert in your primary agency. So if you found this content valuable, others will too. Please give it a thumbs up so they can find it. If you'd like to connect with me personally, do so on LinkedIn. We often do free training webinars and interview federal buyers. Sign up for the GovCon Chambers email list to be notified about these opportunities at www.govconchamber.com. Finally, please consider becoming a sustaining member of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce. Help us keep bringing this great content to you for a dollar a day. I'm Neil McDonald, wishing you great success.